I'm going to go through the presentation I did last year on suturing techniques and tricks at the RNFA conference. I'm going to divide it into segments just to be a little more manageable. And so you may find me looking down at my uh, PowerPoint at times so I can cover everything that is in there. So today we're going to talk about suture materials. The suture material that's used is determined by the surgeon's preference, by the tissue he's working on, and by the goal that he hopes to achieve. So you have your absorbable versus your non-absorbable suture. And the title is pretty self-explanatory. The absorbable is going to be used where the body needs to heal itself, but after that, the suture will should be reabsorbed. So the doctor wants to choose the suture that's going to stay for the length of time that he feels it needs to be there. Different sutures have different absorption rates, and uh, it goes by what brand they are and what size. So the surgeon would probably use that for running subcuticular, for the scarpus, for closing when he's not closing um, fascia. So then we have the non-absorbable, which is like your silk, your proline, your ethabond. The surgeon is going to use the non-absorbable when he wants it to be a permanent stitch that stays in the body. For instance, he would want to use a non-absorbable stitch, permanent stitch on a patch for a carotid. Then you have your braided versus your monofilament. The braided is several strands woven together, so it has a texture to it. Each suture is going to have its pros and cons to it. The doctor needs to choose accordingly. So with the braided, you have the texture, which causes a little more drag when it's pulling it through the tissue. So a braided suture is not one that you would want to use for a vascular. When you're pulling it through a vessel, you want it to slide through easily so it doesn't tear anymore. But the braided suture, for the, the advantage of that, is that the knot is going to be more secure because of that texture. It gives a better hold, so you don't have to throw as many knots. But it is more reactive because of the braids and the, and the texture that I keep talking about. So you wouldn't want to use that right under the skin if you can avoid it, because then the tissue reaction will sometimes make that spit through the skin more, more readily than if you used a monofilament. And because it has the nooks and crannies in it from being woven, it has a slightly greater risk of infection because bacteria can lodge in that. Then you have your monofilament, which is made out of one strand of suture. So it slides through very easily and is easy to work with when you're trying to suture with it. The disadvantage is because it moves easily and it doesn't have that texture. When you tie the knots, they tend to slip more easily. So you would want to tie a couple more knots and make sure that you have them cinched down really securely. There's less tissue reaction, so this is a stitch that you would want to use in areas that you want to have less tissue reaction, like if you're running subcuticular. Not just in general facts about suture material. The thicker the suture, the easier it is for the knot to unravel. And I found this out by accident when I was doing a preparing a graft on the back table for an uh, ACL and the doctor wanted me to keep the suture moistened and I was using a really heavy one. So I was tying the knots and I was going along. I started noticing that some of the ties that I had done were coming loose as they got wet. And I realized that the bigger the suture, the more easily the knot unravels. And if you think about it, look at, the, I'm gonna give you an example here. You have a, a rope this size and you have a string this size. They both have the same knot in them. Which one do you think would be easier for you to get undone? The larger one. So I'm finding the same thing when I suture since then, and I've noticed if you have a, a small, fine suture, it's easier to tie a tight knot than it is on a, on a, large, suture, on a large suture. The other thing you, that you'll find is that when suture gets moist, it tends to weaken. This is usually the rule of thumb with most sutures. There are two exceptions that I know of, and there may be more, but these are the two that I do know for sure. Silk and cotton, both strengthened with fluids. So you figure it's in the body, and it's in a moist environment, so it's going to tend to loosen. So it's just something to keep in the back of your mind and be aware of. Proline is less reactive than nylon. They're both non-absorbable, but since the proline is a little bit less reactive, you might find a, a cosmetic surgeon who wants to use that on the face. Then you have the self-locking sutures, which is a barb suture. Uh, the original was quill, which was a bidirectional, and I think it was probably called quill because it was modeled, probably modeled after the porcupine quill, which has barbs on it that go one, one direction, and but it won't pull back the other direction. If you think about 
those cars that they have the the spikes that you can drive over one direction but if you went the other direction they would they would um pop your tires it's basically the same principle and i have a little picture here to demonstrate that so this is the needle and you can see you'd be pulling the suture this way and you can see as it went through it would slide through because the barbs are this direction but if you try to go the other direction, the barbs would stop it from going back the other way. And then um, the quill has a bi-directional, so it's, the barbs are going the different directions, but you have to sew backwards, so it's a little more difficult. This is a V-lock, and I think there's one other one that I don't know the name of. The V-lock has a little loop on the end that you just put through the loop to tie it, to secure it at the end and then you pull it. Now the important thing with these barb sutures is when you're using them, the self-locking sutures, is that you wanna pull it just tight enough so you get it to the tightness that you want and the skin edges meet nicely. You don't wanna pull it, and it's gonna hold where you, where you, wherever you put it, so you don't wanna to pull too tight. If you pull too tight, the surgeons who have used it that way have found that the tissue reacts and they get poor healing, especially if they're doing it right under the surface. So you wanna make sure on the uh, self-locking that that you don't pull it through tight. When you do a stitch that you're doing near the surface, near the epidermis, you want to bury it as deep as you can so that it doesn't, quote, spit through the incision. That means the body tries to reject that knot because it's sitting right under the epidermis and that will spit it right through, through the skin. So you want to avoid, you want to make it as deep as possible. You have something called epithelialization that takes place after seven to eight days which means anytime there's an open cavity break in the skin, the body is going to try and close that wound. And if it's a, a like a puncture type wound, it's going to try to push the skin down through that puncture wound to, to wall it off and to uh, make the dermis intact again. So when you see these incisions that you see the scar down the middle from the incision that they made and then you see the little poke, polka dot holes, I call it a railroad track, you see the little poke holes on either side from where the suture went in and out, you know that that suture was left in over eight days and that the, that person's body started doing the epithelialization. Now there is a few times when it is something that's desirable and that would be when you're getting your ears pierced, then people count on that, they keep the whatever the stub in, the stud in their ear, until the body will do that epithelialization, then they have that hole permanently. But you don't want that scar if you can avoid it for a patient on their abdomen or elsewhere on their body, unless there's no alternative. So if you are interested in seeing the rest of this, stay tuned and I'm gonna be doing more of the presentation. If you wanna see more of this type of thing, just go on my channel at First Assisting Techniques and Tricks and if you are interested at the end of having the handout that I used at the conference, then feel free to email me and I would be happy to send it to you. Thank you.